حسبنا الله نعم الوكيل نعم المولى ونعم النصير أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم <تصفيق> الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين In one of the more historical sayings of uh, Aba Abdullah Imam Hussain alayhi salam which you can say is his mission statement. Uh, Imam Hussain, not only did he mention the reason why he's standing up, but also mentioned the method and the strategy that he will use to stand up. In a statement that he left behind and said, إِنَّمَا خَرَجْتُ لِطَلَبِ الْإِسْلَاحِ فِي أُمَّةِ جَدِّي That I'm leaving and I'm standing up to do what? To do islah. To reform the nation of my grandfather. So the reason, the purpose for his stand was islah. To bring about reformation of the Ummah. And then he mentions Uridu an Amura bil Maruf wa anha anil munkar that I want to do Amar bil Maruf and Nahil Munkar. And then after that he now states okay I'm standing up I'm going to rise up but this rising of mine is has a method it has a strategy. How am I going to do this? He said, Asiro Besira Te Jaddi wa Abi Ali ibn Abi Talib. He said that I will practice and I will stand based on the practice and the lifestyle of my grandfather and my father. You see, this is the strategy. Here Imam Hussain is mentioning how he's going to stand up. Why? Because of Islam. He wants to reform the people. But how? Based on the sirat of my grandfather and my father. And this is, uh, when we look at this, that Imam Hussain is bringing our focus to the sirat of the Prophet, and the seerah of Imam Ali and saying that if you want to know how I'm going to do this then it is based on their seerah based on what they have done then you can understand my stance let me now inshallah explain that if you send loud salawats <laughs> hence this statement obviously is uh, you can say a key statement of Imam Hussain which you can also say that if anyone asks you, what did Imam Hussain do? What did he do? All right, what did he rise up for? Then you can use this hadith to say that this is what he did. First, he did Islam based on the seerat of the Prophet and his grandfather and his father. That's how he did it. This is, you can say, the main thing and hence for us, he wanted us to learn the seerat of the Prophet. Why did he mention this? Why did he mention this at the beginning of his movement? Is he's one thing to say that, you know what, I'm going to rise up to do Islam. But it's another thing that you say, well, this is how I'm going to do this. Why is he mentioning the seerat? Why is he saying, Asiro be seerat jaddi wa abi? At the beginning of his movement. And this is something that we want to Really understand. Imam Hussain obviously is not saying this because it rhymes with the other things. <laughs> when you look at the Prophet and the Imams, they don't speak without wisdom. 
And there is immense amount of wisdom in how they say things, in what they say things. And so, when Imam Hussein is mentioning this, to whom? To the Muslims. It itself shows that there's a hidden meaning behind this, first. First of all, there's a hidden meaning behind this. For example, if I come to you and say that, listen, you know, inshallah, you know, we all want, you know, if we, I want to live like Imam Ali. And you will be like, of course, we all do. Right? What's so special about that? Right? You know, we all say that, you know, we want to do something, you know, uh, like Ahlul Bayt did it. You all will be like, well, of course, we all want to do that. Why, why do you even have to mention this? We already know this, right? Now, if I mention this, in, with the fact that you should know this, then there's a hidden meaning behind this. Imam Hussain is mentioning that I'm going to practice the seerat of the Prophet in front of whom? In front of the Ummah, in front of the Muslims. By saying this, what he wants to say and what he wants us to understand is that this seerat of the Prophet in Imam Ali is something that has been neglected and has been abandoned. That's why he's saying this. You see, why would you say that to Muslims? That I want to live like the Prophet. No, we're all Muslims, we want to live like the Prophet. No, it's because you have left living like the Prophet. That's why I'm mentioning this. This is why I'm mentioning this. The idea behind this is because people stopped the practice and the seed of the Prophet. This is something that they had abandoned. They did not want to do. And when Imam Hussain is mentioning this, it's like he wants to say that this is something that has not been done. And it's not even just him. Even before him, the seed was abandoned. In the time of his father, Imam Ali, السلام, we see the same thing. That when uh, the second Khalifa, Omar, when he was dying and he appointed a council to choose the next one in line. So he appointed six people. He said, you six people, you get into a room and choose one of you to be the leader and the next Khalifa. And if you don't, I'll kill all of you. And that's why you see Imam Ali had to take part in this frivolous activity. So Imam Ali also was one of them. Was one of the six. He went there. And then after some debate, right, the vote was divided two and two. With one person remaining, Abdullah ibn Auf. Uh, Abdurrahman ibn Auf. This Abdurrahman ibn Auf, right, he told Imam Ali that, listen, I'm with you. Right? I mean, I want to work for you. But, I want to ask you some questions before that. He says, uh, how would you lead us? If you become the Khalifa, how would you lead us? So Imam Ali said that, I will lead you according to the book and the seerat of the Prophet. You see why? You see again, Imam Ali is mentioning this here. He's saying that I will lead you according to the seerat of the Prophet. He says, That's it? <laughs> said, of course, that's it. That's all? Yes, that's all. He said, Then no. He asked Usman, So what do you will do? <laughs> Obviously, he says, you know, I want to do the seerat of the Shaykhan. We need the two who were before him, Abu Bakr and Omar. So obviously they accepted him. But in this situation, you look at this. Imam Ali said, I want to lead you according to the seerat of the Prophet. And they rejected that. In other words, the seerat of the Prophet was rejected way before Imam Hussein ever came into the scene. They rejected the seerat of the Prophet. They said, no, you can't lead according to that. So when you look at the history, you see that the seerat of the Prophet is something that has been ignored has been neglected, has been abandoned by Muslims right from the start. And Imam Ali is reminding the Ummah of that, and Imam Hussain is reminding the Ummah of that. This is what we want to understand. Why is Imam Hussain reminding? 
Why is Imam Hussain relating his movement and mission to the seerat of the Prophet and <coughs> Imam Ali? Why is it that he's doing that? Because this is something that when we all want to uh, be uh, close to the Imam and we want to be uh, his helper, we want to be someone who is beside the Imam, then these are secrets that Imam Hussain and Imam Ali and Imam Hassan are giving us by which we can learn. And this is what we want to do. Hopefully in these three days I will speak about why Imam Hussain mentioned the seerah to the Prophet and what is the meaning behind that. And what is the lesson in it for us. Because right now we see the history. What is the lesson right now for us in that? So just to start it off here, uh, when you look at it, when we ask the question, okay, you know, what is it for us right now? Why are we looking at it? What does it mean for us that Imam Hussain raised this issue? My friends, the seerat of the Prophet was so sensitive. It was so, uh, it was an issue that was so difficult that when Imam Hussain said that I want to practice the seerat of the Prophet, then the Muslim Ummah killed him for it. They cut his companions to pieces for it. Why was it so difficult for them to digest the seerat of the Prophet? Imam Hussain is saying, I'm standing up according to the seerat of the Prophet. They said, we'll kill you if you say that. We'll kill you for it. Why is it? Why was it so difficult? This is what we want to understand. Salawat ala Muhammad wa When we look at the Sirat, and when we look at how Imam Hussain is trying to focus the attention of the people on this practice of the Prophet. Now Sirat is different than history. History is the uh, events that happened, occurrences that happened, and an analysis of those events. For example, this war happened, this treaty happened, why did it happen, and these type of things. This is history. Sirat is different than history. Because the focal point of history is events. The focal point of Sirat is the uh, reaction of the Prophet and the role of the Prophet in that event. What did the Prophet do at that time? What did Imam Ali do at that time? This is the focus of Sirat. What we want to learn is the Sirat of the Prophet. Many times we see that the Sirat is truly what makes or encourages us. You know, it is more than just a, for example, a reaction of the Prophet. The reason why we learn the reaction of the Prophet is because that is the spirit of Islam. That is the spirit that that is the encouragement, the inspiration that we have to actually do things. Really. A lot of times we make mistakes in teaching our children. Right? Instead of trying to teach them the seerat, we end up teaching them history. In history they learn about what? This event happened, that event happened, so how are they being improved? How are they being helped? What does it mean to them? It doesn't matter to them at the end. Okay, these things happen. But when you speak about and focus on the role of the Prophet and Imam Ali, then you see that it becomes personal for them. It becomes an encouragement for them. For example, you teach your son or your child how to pray. You know, this is prayer and this is prayer and this and that. And this is how you do sajda, this is how you do ruku. You know what, you can teach them as much as they want, they will give you a bored look. Right? As if you're speaking to a wall, you know, something that's inanimate. <laughs> I'm talking to you. Listen, this is how you do it. This is how you do ruku. This is how you do sajda. But if you mention that, you know what? Rasulullah used to do ruku like this. Now you see, he'll be like, really? He did it like this? You know, again, that, that image, that picture is what inspires him. I want to do it like that too. I, when you say that uh, <laughs> Imam Ali used to pray like this, then you see that becomes real for them. You see, that Sirat is what gives life to Islam. 
is what makes us do things. This is what Sirat is. And that's why we want to learn this Sirat. You want to know the Sirat because of that reason. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Now the first point that I want to mention in regards to Sirat of the Prophet when Imam Hussein is mentioning it. When Imam Hussein mentioned this statement and he said to the people that listen I'm standing up but I'm standing up on the method that the Prophet lived. The method that Imam Ali lived. Now by saying this, did Imam, Hussain, did Imam Hussain mean that he's going to be violent? Did he mean that he was going to be harsh or strict? What was the impression of the Sirat of the Prophet? What did it mean that when I say, for example, I want to do what the Prophet did? You see, for example, if I say, you know, I want to do something... Uh, Husseini style right? I want to do something Husseini style so everyone thinks Husseini means revolutionary you know uprising you know being harsh you know I mean this is what Husseini means you know there was a time I remember uh, in uh, recent times you know we see that there was a statement by uh, by Imam Khomeini, rahmatullah, when he spoke to the people and he said that, listen, if people want to do zulm on us, this and that, then we will walk in extreme trials. Even in many hardships, he was gentle, kind, and loving and caring. When we look at the life of Imam Ali and we say that I want to practice the seerat of Ali, does that mean that I'm going to take a sword and kill all the bad people? Or does it mean that I'm going to forego my rights and live 25 years isolated from the people under isolation and suppression? What life, what part of Imam Ali's life comes to your mind? What part of his life comes to your mind? You see, again, this is when Imam Hussein is mentioning this. At the beginning of his movement, he is telling the people that I am rising up. I am standing up because what's happening is wrong. But the way I am going to do it, the method that I am going to practice is gentleness. I will be kind with you. I will be gentle with you. Just like Rasulullah was gentle with you. Just like my father Imam Ali was gentle with you. My friend, understand this. This is a Imam Hussein by mentioning this. He's saying that, listen, I will be gentle with you. I won't be hard. I will care. I'll, I'll be very caring with you. You see, was this a threat Imam Hussein was giving? Or was it an appeasement that he's saying that, listen, don't be scared of me. Don't be scared of what I'm doing. I will be gentle with you. I will be nice with you. This is what he's saying. Now, my friends, understand this. Imam Hussain wasn't trying to make the people afraid. Wasn't trying to frighten the people. In fact, he was trying to remove their fears by this statement. By saying, Asiro be sirate jaddi wa bi, he's saying, listen, don't worry, I will be kind. So there's no need for people to worry, right? Now you understand that meaning. Yes, it is true that Batil is naturally afraid of Haq. When you put truth and falsehood together, you see that falsehood is afraid of truth. Whatever falsehood, whenever something wrong and false sees the truth coming, it will try to run away. You see, it can't handle it. If you see a person who's truthful and one person who's false and wrong, you will see that the person who's wrong will be afraid, always afraid. They're always afraid. And this is the reason why, for example, those who are ahle batil, those who are people of falsehood, these people are the ones, because of the fact that they're afraid of the truth, they're the ones who are all, all the time plotting against truth. 
The reason they're planning and plotting is because they're afraid. If the people who are ahl haq they don't uh, have like, for example, drawing rooms where they make plots and plans. They don't do that. You know, they say Allah is the best planner. He will take care of it. We just have to do our duty. The reason we don't is because we are not afraid. We don't have that fear of batil. Batil has the fear of truth that they have to have think tanks and plan over there how we are going to take care of the truth. It's because they're afraid. This is a natural fear that people have. This is the natural fear that people have. So yes, when Imam Hussein stood up and said, I'm rising up against Yazid, Yazid had a fear. But the fear that Yazid had was a natural fear that falsehood has from truth. Imam Hussein didn't do anything to put fear in his heart. Imam Hussein didn't threaten him. Imam Hussein didn't show that I'm going to come after and beat you up. Imam Hussein did not put that fear in that. You see, it's a different type of fear. The fear that Yazid had of Imam Hussein is different than the fear that the low lives and scumbags of Kufa had when Ibn Ziyad told them that this army is coming to kill you. When uh, Ibn Akil, Muslim Ibn Akil, when he came out with all the people around and Ibn Ziyad was inside the palace, what happened there? What happened there was that Imam, when all of these people came out, Ibn Ziyad said, listen, there's an army coming. There's an army coming and when they find out you're here, they're going to kill you and your woman and your children. So now, when, they, when these people heard Ibn Ziyad say that, they became afraid. Now the fear that these people had it's a different type of fear. This fear is a threat to their life. It's a threat to their well-being. And they became so afraid of an imaginary army. The army is not even there. It's an imaginary army that never came, that never was. He knew how to make the people afraid. They were so afraid of an imaginary army that they ran back home from their front door and they came out the back door with their swords to kill Imam Hussein. This is different type of fear. Imam Hussein wasn't giving that fear to the people. Imam Hussein didn't want to give that fear. Imam Hussein is saying, listen, Asiro Besirate Jaddi wa Abi, I will be gentle with you. I will be caring with you. Salawat. Now, by saying this, Imam Hussein is saying that I'll be nice. I'll be a nice guy. If you were his advisor, that Imam Hussein is rising up, he's going forward, and you know that he's going to rise up against an emperor, and there's going to be conflict, there's going to be fighting, what would you advise him? Would you advise him to make statements like that? He said, Mawla, <laughs> if you make statements like this, you're giving the green light to the enemy to become bolder and stronger. I mean, if you're saying you're going to be nice, are they going to give importance to you? No, you need to act rough. You need to be rough with them. Be tough with them. Tell them. Right? We'll use our swords. We'll kill your woman. And then you'll see they'll have fear of you. Right? I mean, what would you advise him? As an advisor, if you were his military advisor to Imam Hussein, what would you tell him? That Imam Hussein, you know, what are you doing? <coughs> If you say that you will be gentle with them, these people will take advantage of you. These people will take advantage of you. And you know what? What you're saying would be right also. It will be right. And they did take advantage. Imam Hussein is saying the same thing. What I'm telling you is that I'm going to act in a way, if you look at the Sirat of the Prophet and Imam Ali, I will be acting in a way that people will take advantage of me. You will see that there will be low lives and scumbags who will surround me and it will take my life. This is exactly what I'm saying. Imam Hussain will tell you that. That is exactly what will happen to me. By being this kind and gentle. Why is this my friends? Why is Imam Hussain doing this? Really, this is what we need to know. Why is he doing this? 
if he wants to go forward, there are ignorant people that we have who because of the fact that Karbala has blood, that it is a bloody affair, they think that Imam Hussein was aggressive. That Imam Hussein was on the offensive. Imam Hussein was someone who stood up. In fact, they make these misguided comparison and say that Imam Hussein was the one who was peaceful and they he always wanted truth and peace. Imam Hussein was the hard-headed one, you know, one who wanted war. <laughs> these misguided and uncalled for comparison that have no reality in any history or any ideology. When you look at these comparisons, what are these for? Just because they see blood there. Just because they see the Battle of Karbala and they see people died there. And just because of that, they come to these conclusions that Imam Hussein was some, some sort of way aggressive. When you look at Imam Hussein, he's saying at the beginning, my seed, the way that I'm going to do this is through gentleness and care and love and compassion. This is my way. Look at the seed of the How did he do it? Let's look at that if you send us our hearts. One more salawat. The Messenger of Allah, when you look at him and when you see how he uh, lived his life and what he did, and when you look at Imam Ali, how he did things, you will see that there's some points in that history where you have to look at this. One point I will mention so that you reflect on this for today and we will end it because of the fact that we are already late and I don't want to be long today. Inshallah, we'll have more time tomorrow to cover the, more of the seerahs. Right? But just one thing, right? When you look at the history of Imam Ali, you see that Imam Ali you know, was a very uh, strong person. He was a fighter, a warrior in the battlefield uh, who had no peer. There is no comparison. History is a proof of that. I, even then, Imam Ali fought the best of the best, the strongest of the strong, who came out to fight against Islam and he took them apart. Ah, uh, it's proven. Right? It is clear with that. And you see that, for example, if you know someone is strong, then obviously you are careful what you say in front of him. Right? I mean, you are careful <laughs> speaking in front of him, you know? You can't just call him off because, you know, he is known to, you know, he is known single-handedly defeat armies. Mm -hmm. Imam Ali single-handedly defeated the army of Jama. Single-handedly he did it. I, there wasn't even a comparison how he went there. Imam Ali, when he defeated the best of the best, people know that, you know, he's strong. He, he, he has a technique of fighting. And you know what? He can easily get rid of you. So you would be careful. You wouldn't just go to his door and knock down his door. You wouldn't just go up to his door and burn it down. You wouldn't just go to his door and break it on top of his wife. You wouldn't just go to his house and tie him up in ropes and drag him to the masjid. You wouldn't do that, right? You wouldn't do that. Like, well, I mean, <laughs> what kind of psychology is this? That this warrior who has proven himself in war, everyone knows he's stronger than them, he can single-handedly beat all of them, why is it so easy for them to come to his house, break his door down, burn his house, injure his wife, and drag him in the streets? I mean, it was so easy for them to do it. They weren't afraid of all, at all, for doing that. Can you imagine that? Why is it that it was so easy for them to go there and to do this to Imam Ali? Why is it so easy for them to do that? My friends, here is what you need to understand. What Sirat means. What Sirat means. And this is, I want to leave it here, inshallah, at this point. What is the meaning of Sirat? What is the meaning of Sirat? This understood here. Everyone knew that Imam, that Imam Ali is the strongest man 
in Medina. Everyone knew that there's no way that they can ever beat him. Even not even one on one contest. Not even a group on one contest. They can't beat him. They know that Imam Ali could take care of them. But they knew if they were looking at the biceps of Ali, they would never go to his house. But they knew that Imam Ali did not live by his biceps. He lived by his Imam. He did not live by his biceps. He lived by his faith. He lived by his ideology in Allah. That's how he lived. They knew that. That's why they took advantage of it. They knew that. This. That's why they took advantage of it. Why do you think they took advantage of that? They knew Imam Ali would not do anything to them. This is the same way how easy it was it for them to come to the tents of Imam Hussein. They knew that these people are good. That they won't do anything wrong. They knew that. You know? Um, on the night of Ashura, this will be one instant. What does this mean? What does this mean? On the night of Ashura, Burair uh, was one of the companions of Imam Hussain. He saw Shimra scouting the tents of Imam Hussain. Shimra, who came around to scout the tents of Imam Hussain. He saw him scouting the tents. And then he told Imam Hussain that, Mawla, I have him in my range. I have him in my range. Let me take a shot at him. I can get rid of him. This person is a wicked person. He will be trouble for us. I have him right in my range. Let me kill him so we can get rid of this menace. That we can get rid of this person who will do many wrong things. He's right here. Let's kill him. Imam Hussein said, Burair, we do not start wars. We don't start wars. See, how long are you going to practice the Sirat? <coughs> to what extent are you going to practice the Sirat? And you know what? Burair was right. Burair was right. That shimmer ended up on the chest of Imam Hussain. Right? He ended up there, right? My friends, the seerat of the Prophet, inshallah, just keep that in mind. Let me just mention one seerat for you today. How do we read seerat? How do we understand seerat? From here, inshallah, you will know this. You know, Abdullah ibn Abbas says that one of the practices of the Prophet, one of the seerat of the Prophet. And you know what, when the Prophet did something and you see that this is a seerat, it means there's a reality behind it. There is a hakikat and there is a reality that's behind it. That's why he's doing it. Abdullah ibn Abbas says that one of the seerat of the Prophet, as a seerat he's mentioning, one of the seerat of the Prophet is that the Prophet, no matter where he was, no matter what he was doing, he might be giving a lecture, he might be praying, he might be with his friends, he might be having a discussion, he might be in the house, he might be in the battlefield. No matter where Rasulullah was, no matter what mood was he was in, whether he was sad, whether he was happy, it didn't matter. One of the seerat of the Prophet is that whenever he laid his eyes on Imam Hussain, he would start crying. <laughs> You know, he would start crying. That's it. He would leave everything and just tears would come out of his eyes. He would start crying. Yeah. Do you understand this, my friends? This is the seerat of the Prophet. Every time he saw Imam Hussain, he would just look at him and start crying. Can you imagine what he was looking at when he saw Imam Hussain? You know, what Fatima went through in Medina, everyone knows. The doors of Medina are a witness on the zulm that Fatima faced in Medina. Everyone knows that. But when Rasulullah used to look at Fatima, he always smiled. He smiled. There was one time we see in the history of Imam Ali where he cried looking at Imam Ali. It was in the month of Shaban. Rasulullah was giving a lecture about the month of Ramadan. Imam Ali stood up and asked Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, what is the best amal? What is the best action to do in the month of Ramadan? Rasulullah just looked at Imam Ali and started crying. <laughs> <laughs> Imam 
Imam Ali asked him, that, Ya Rasulullah, what are you crying for? What are you crying for? Okay, Rasulullah said that, Ali, my mind went to that time when I see that your beard will be drenched with your blood. <laughs> One time Imam Ali, for what Imam Ali went through, Rasulullah cried once, and we see that in the history, even once he cried. But for Imam Hussain, every time he looked at Hussain, he would be crying. Can you imagine what did Rasulullah see? What happened to Hussein in Karbala that is making Rasulullah cry so much? Really, my friends, after all these years, after all the years of reading Masayib and about Imam Hussain and doing research on Imam Hussain, the books of Maktal and the books of history do not justify what happened to Imam Hussain in Karbala. Really, they don't justify what happened to Imam Hussain in Karbala. It is looking at the seerah that I understood what happened to Imam Hussain in Karbala. <laughs> looking at the seerah, what? What is making Rasulullah cry so much? What happened to Imam Hussain in Karbala that we don't know of? That Rasulullah won't stop crying. And do you know want to know one more thing? Now if you know what Rasulullah is seeing and what he's imagining, looking at what happened to Karbala, what happened to Imam Hussain in Karbala, he's crying so much, then just, now I want you to understand the heart of Zainab who has witnessing that. You know, Zainab is actually seeing that, what Rasulullah is imagining. <laughs> Salam young Zainab who went through that that has made Rasulullah just imagine it and cry so much. Can you imagine that? La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. This is Karbala. What is Karbala? Really what is Karbala my friends? You know? You know uh, the journey of Karbala and in any journey take any travel plan you have to make a journey to go somewhere you want to go for a hajj you want to go for a ziyarat you want to go to karbala you want to go any place it is said that you know before you choose your destination choose your companions choose your companions before you choose your destination really why because the companions they will make up for all the shortcomings of the trip Having good companions there, someone who can be there with you and who the hardships of the journeys will go away when you have good companions to travel with. You know, Zainab chose her companions very well. When you see Zainab, she chose her companions. Zainab had such companions, such travel companions, that if you travel from one end of the world to the other end of the world, there is no way Zainab would get tired of the journey. Really, the companions that Zainab had, Ali Akbar, Abbas, where can you get these companions to travel with? Zainab, imagine what she was going through in that journey to Karbala. Every time that Zainab would want to do something, Ali Akbar would be there saying, ah, don't do this, I'm here for you. Why, are you. why are you taking the trouble to do this? Every time Zainab would uh, bend down to pick up something, five Hashimi youth will come forward and say, please lady, you don't do this, you are too great to do this, let us do the work for you. Imagine what Ummar Abab is going through when she is going through this journey that every time she's holding Ali Asghar in her hand, Ali Akbar would come and say, let me hold it, you're tired, let me take care of him while you rest. Imagine what these ladies are going through by seeing such beautiful companions, by beautiful people who are with them. But you know what happened? Such companions, imagine if Abbas was traveling with you, if Abbas was your companion, how would you feel in that journey? You would say, let this journey not end because, you know, I have Abbas who's traveling with me. Abbas is traveling with me. Why would I want this journey to end? 
<laughs> Can you imagine that? But you know what? When they came to Karbala on the second of Muharram, when they came to Karbala on the second of Muharram, we saw that they did not smile after that. Even with companions like Abbas and Ali Akbar, we see that the ladies were not even smiling in Karbala. This is what Karbala is. Even with all of that, they were not smiling. This is how hard it is, my friends, when you come to there. Why are we crying now? Really, why are we crying? Why are you crying for? You know, yes, you know, you're crying after Ashura. My friends, you're crying after Ashura. But you know what? I'll give you a reason to cry. You really want to cry? Are you a man? Does your vision reach that far? You know what you should cry for? You know, everyone cries for Ashura. What happened in Ashura? But only a moment can understand the tragedy that happened before Ashura. Only a moment can understand that. His eyes can go that far. And he begins to kill himself before Ashura even comes. Let me not see Ashura. Even before that, Imam Hussain, what happened with you is enough to kill me. It is enough to kill me. You know what? This is an example I will mention this to you, and from here you go. You know, Hur stopped the path of Imam Hussain. Hur blocked the path of Imam Hussain, and the people of Kufa, they did not want him. This is it. That's why you should cry. The people of Kufa rejected Imam Hussain. This is why you should cry, my friends. Do you understand the tragedy that happened to Imam Hussain? This is enough for a moment to kill himself. Imam Hussain was blocked. Imam Hussain was stopped. That's it. And that is enough for us to die. You know why? Imagine this. I'll give you an example and from there you can understand it very well. You are invited as a guest somewhere. You are invited to come to someone's house. He invited you to come there. And he invited you to come so you take your family and kids and say, this person has invited us. Let us go to his house. He's invited us as a guest. So now you go there, you ring the doorbell, he opens the door for you, you're standing with your family and children, and you say, well, I'm here. He says, what for? He says, I'm your guest. He says, I didn't invite you. <laughs> Imagine how humiliated you will feel. <laughs> Imagine how humiliated you will feel at that point. You know, Imam Hussain was invited to Kufa, <laughs> and he came with his family and children. Now when he came, us. Why are they acting like this with us? This is where someone should look at and say that Imam Hussain, your path has been blocked. This is enough of a tragedy for us. That which happens later, that we don't want to live that far to see what happens there. Can you imagine a moment living that far to see Ali Akbar being killed like that? Can you imagine a moment living that far to see Ali Asghar being killed like this? No, we will not wait that long. Today, we see that when Imam Hussain came to Karbala, that was a tragedy for Imam Hussain. And now when they came here, and now that they came here, you see the smile left their face. And then when they left Karbala, then that scene that they took, and that image that they took from Karbala, can you imagine that image of Imam Zainul Abidin looking at his father? <laughs> Can you imagine Imam Zainal Abdin looking at his father? I mean, what must he have felt that Imam Hussein, his father, is lying on Karbala, the land of Karbala? He is lying on the land of Karbala. No one, no, I mean, really, if your father dies, can you imagine how much sensitive you will be to make sure that everything is done in the right way? Everything is done in the right way. Someone came to Imam Zainul Abidin. He didn't come to him. He was there in front of him. He was there in front of him. And he was saying that, help me, help me. I am gharib. I am faqir. Help me. I am gharib here. Help me. I am gharib here. Help me. Imam Zainul Abidin heard him say, ana gharib, ana gharib. He says, come here. He said, what, what gharib are you? How much gharib are you? He said, I'm gharib, I have no one here. He said, tell me, if you die here today, and you have no one here today, do you expect these Muslims to give you kafan and dafan? Do you expect these Muslims to put you in the grave? 
And so the poor, they're Muslim, I'm a Muslim also. They should do that, it's wajib on them, wajib kifai, they should do that for me. He said that don't call yourself gharib. My father was gharib in Karbala. My father was gharib in Karbala. That when he was left there, there was no kafan on his body. He wasn't buried in the ground, he was left under the burning sun, on the burning sand. He is gharib, don't call yourself gharib. Say, Allahumma <laughs> 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 <laughs>